from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good morning. My name is Rachel Hardigan Shea, editor of the Washington Post Book World. The Washington Post is very proud to be a charter sponsor of the National Book Festival, and I am very pleased to introduce the next author. Nell Irvin Painter is one of the leading historians in and of this country. She's a professor of American history at Princeton University, where she has also served as director of Princeton's program in African American Studies. She's written seven books, including Sojourner Truth, Standing at Armageddon, which is a history of the progressive era, and the history of white people. In the history of white people, she argues that, I quote, race is an idea, not a fact, and traces the development of that idea from classical times to the present. Not one to shy away from a challenge, she has arm wrestled Stephen Colbert on TV and is currently working on an MFA in painting at the Rhode Island School of Design. Please join me in welcoming Nell Irvin Painter. Hi folks, thank you so much for staying. Glad to see you all. Uh, I'm not going to read from my book, The History of White People. I'm gonna talk about it a little bit and then leave some time for questions. And if you have a question, please use the mics. So if you already have a question, you can go to the mic now. I often get asked, uh, why did I write the history of white people? As if my body would stop me from any area of inquiry. I'm a historian and I write on what I want. I was thinking when I started this book uh, back in the end of the 20th century. Why are white people called Caucasian? Have any of you asked yourself that? Do you know why? No. And this was when the rush, well, it's still happening, the Russians and the Chechens and Chechnyas and uh, the Caucasus were having tremendous struggles. So why are white Americans called Chechens? Well, I did find the answer. Uh, the answer took me to Germany. Took me to Germany in the 18th century. Now, the idea of race was invented in the 18th century. It doesn't go back to antiquity. There were not white people in antiquity. But since so many people thought that, I thought I should address it. So my book actually starts with the Greeks and the Romans and their commentary on the people who became Europeans. And what the Greeks and the Romans discovered were people who lived in various ways. For the Greeks, they talked about what we call culture. And for the Romans, who warred in various ways because the Romans were imperialists and were very interested in who was a good fighter and who could help and who had to be vanquished. I followed this German idea into the United States via Madame de Stael, who was a French intellectual, and Thomas Carlyle, who was a British intellectual, and Ralph Waldo Emerson. So I spent a long time with Ralph Waldo Emerson who was the kind of genius of 19th century white race theory. Ralph Waldo Emerson didn't have a great deal to say about black people, but he had a lot to say about white people. Now in the 19th century, the idea prevailed that there were many white races. So there were people who were considered white, no one questioned their whiteness, very clearly, the Irish were white. Very clearly, people descended from English people or Scottish people were white or German people. But they belonged to different races. They were white, but they belonged to different races. So, for instance, the Irish Catholics were thought to belong to the Celtic race. And people descended from English people were thought to belong to the Saxon race. 
and the Saxons were better than the Celts. It was not until the middle of the 20th century, which many of us remember vividly, that the idea of one big white race came into being, in which everybody was who was white was the same as everybody else. And it's not an accident that that happened through politics. It happened through the national mobilization of the Great Depression, the Second World War, and the federal policies crafted after the Second World War. So one big white race is an idea based in politics. My book is called The History of White People. Let me say a few things that it does not do. It does not talk very much about people who are not white. There's very little about African Americans, Indians, uh, Asians, Latinos, people of color. They do appear from time to time and they appear very much at the end, but it really is a book about the construction of the idea of white races. It's not a book in which I get to beat up white people for the bad things they've done to others. And when I started, sometimes people would say to me, are you writing it as a black person? And I would say, I would get huffy, and I would say, I'm writing it as a historian. But I realized that what they meant, are you going to use this book to settle scores? No, I don't settle scores. It's not about what white people have done to others. So it's not very much about black people, which is what we usually think of in the United States when we think about race. When people hear the word race, they automatically jump to African American history or to black people. This is not my book. What I did learn was that race is an idea that is used to create at worst, to create bad separation and to rank people and to stigmatize. It can be used as a tool of hatred. It can be used as a tool of racism. Sometimes race is a source of pride. It can be a source of identity in which people rally around and find themselves together in difficult circumstances. It can be a response to racism, racial pride. But wherever the situation occurs, race functions to identify difference, to separate. Even at best, it separates. And it's always used loosely, but it says these are people who are permanently this way, and these are people who are permanently that way. Sometimes it says these are people who are permanently like this and like that. So I learned as I worked on this book about 10 years that whether the races in question are colored or the races in question are white, that race is a tool of differentiation and separation. Someone asked me uh, when I was doing my book tour earlier this year if I favored a national, a national debate on race. Let me ask you, let's take a vote. Do you think it's a good idea for us to have a national discussion about race? If you think yes, put your hand up. If you think no, put your hand up. If you're not sure, put both hands up. <laughs> we got a lot of not sure, yeah. Um, if you had asked me that before I worked on my book, I probably would have said, yeah, it's a good idea because we need to clear the air. But then when I realized how 
these ideas, and race is an idea, it is not a biological fact, it is an idea. As I worked on the history of this idea, I began to change my mind. And I now no longer favor the idea of a discussion of race. I would much prefer that we had a discussion of the various conditions, concerns, actions, thoughts, opinions, wishes that we share. I would much prefer that we de-emphasize difference and re-emphasize likeness. I much prefer that we work, thank you. I much prefer that we think about what holds us together so that in this moment of national crisis, we can work together. I want to stop here with the word together and invite questions or comments. Yes. Thank you, Professor. That was You're great. very welcome. That was, Thank uh, you. One of the ones who put their hands in the air for we should have a discussion, and then I'd like to change my answer to what you just said. Okay. So um, <laughs> I uh, was wondering, uh, since we're talking about it, <clears throat> the uh, word white people, the word mm -hmm. black people, and mm -hmm. I heard you use the word African American, and I wonder if we're ready to maybe stop using that expression and start using the word black more. I, I don't. I wonder, uh, just as a black person yourself. Yeah if you feel like that's a comfortable way to be labeled? Um, the book that I published before the white book was the black book. Uh. <laughs> it's called Creating Black Americans, African American History and Its Meanings, 1619 to the Present. And in that book, I did use the word black. And I use it because it's a more encompassing word and a less cumbersome word than African American or all these other terms. The reason it really stuck out, um, I remember facing a class at Princeton in which there were several uh, students of African descent. Some of them were people whose ancestors, whose African ancestors uh, left involuntarily in the 18th century. So they were Americans with very deep roots. Others had themselves been brought to the United States as children or their parents were immigrants. So we talked about nomenclature and we said, well, what do you call brown colored people of African descent with deep American roots? They said, oh, those are African Americans. So what do you call brown colored people of African descent who came from Africa last week? And they said, oh, those are African African Americans. <laughs> so I'm thinking about my book and the length of the book and the number of, of uh, words I can get in. And I'm thinking how long African African American is and you know, Caribbean African Americans and Latino African American, you know. If, so I just use black. <laughs> yes. Hi. When you read about current uh, statements by political leaders regarding immigration and Islam and so on, is there a period of American history that seems most instructive to you and what does it teach us? Yeah, uh, the current uh, brouhaha over um, immigration, to my mind, sounds just like the period right after the First World War. And this was a period of uh, hostility and hysteria against immigrants from Europe. And the races, as people said, were the Jewish race, the Slavic race, uh, the Italian, actually there were two Italian races. There was the North Italian race and the South Italian race. These were considered races and they actually had been scientifically certified to be uh, intellectually inferior. And that hysteria actually led to a cutting off of European immigration, first in 1921 and then in 1924. So it sounds to me 
like um, 1919, 1920, 1921, until about the mid-20s. Yes? In, in talking about the development of the concept of the, quote, white race, you said this developed largely uh, after World War II. And you said one, one of the things you said that contributed to it, in addition to the war itself, was national policies. And I wonder if you could uh, explain a little bit Certainly. more what you meant by that. Certainly. National policies. Uh, during the 19-teens, um, in the early part of the 20th century, there, there was not a lot of political mobilization to get people voting and particularly not to get immigrants and the children of immigrants voting. But during the Great Depression, uh, as Franklin Roosevelt and his team of Democrats tried to get some heft on their side, they mobilized this uh, group of naturalized uh, Americans or their children who had been born in the United States who were of the working class, they were workers, and they tended to vote Democratic when they voted. So there was first a mobilization of voters on the Democratic side during the Great Depression, and that made possible the New Deal and continuing the New Deal. During the Second World War, there was an even greater emphasis on national unity in order to pursue the goals of the Second World War. And the Second World War was a war against uh, fascists and Nazis and racial states. And so there was a groundswell of culture, partly fostered by uh, the federal government, but largely because um, many Americans felt that we needed to pull together. It was a kind of multiculturalism, uh, avant la lettre, before the word. So that came out of the Second World War. And then after the Second World War, there were two very important policies that created the suburbs. One was the Federal Housing Administration, which was not new, but, be, but took on a very important new role as a guarantor of mortgage lending, and the Veterans Administration, and this is the GI Bill of Rights. These were administered in a cruelly racist fashion, and they underwrote the suburbs in a way that white people of any background were able to get these wonderful 30-year fixed rate mortgages, low down payment. And people living in mixed neighborhoods, city neighborhoods, black neighborhoods could not. Remember that it was not illegal to discriminate in lending and housing policies until 1968. So the suburbs became white land, uh, people who had been part of these many white races, and the cities became black land. And then there's Malcolm X, who always talked about the white man. He didn't say, the South Italian has been oppressing you. He said, the white man. So the post-war era really cemented this sense of a black world and a white world separated by a chasm. Hi. Uh, first of all, I, I do own your book. I haven't read it yet, but after this, I'm, I'm going to. Um, I wanted to address two things. First of all, you talked about um, that when you were writing the book, people were coming to you and saying, is this something that you're going to use to settle a score? Uh, curious, was that uh, audience that came to say that to you, was it generational? Did you have older people that were saying that, younger people, or was it across the board? Older people. Okay. Okay. <laughs> of whom I am a card-carrying <laughs> member. <laughs> but I must say, that has changed. Okay. And for that, I want to thank the American people. Yeah. Another question? The second question was, when you talked about race being um, the uh, culmination of race and the white race, per se, being a political thing, mm -hmm. uh, my question is, and you kind of just kind of dovetailing on what the gentleman before me talked about, if it was uh, a political thing and it was meant not only to uh, uh, get people to vote a certain way, but it was also meant to entitle, if you have a situation where that is happening, what is going to encourage people that are entitled to have a conversation about equality? 
I don't know. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Yes, I have a comment. Um, I have two of my grandchildren are... Can you speak a little more? I can't quite hear you. Two of my grandchildren are European, Southeast Asian, Indian, and African American. And so they aren't a race. They're not a race. And I discuss their ethnic backgrounds. Mm -hmm. And I don't understand why we don't replace the term race with ethnicity. Because we do all have different ethnic backgrounds. I'm German and Irish. My grandchildren have like five ethnic grandchild backgrounds. And that's the current state of America. So the discussion of race is really anachronistic. Any comment? The discussion of race has never made sense except as uh, a means of ranking people, as differentiating people. And the, the means and the discussion have always differed. So there's never been any scientific or non-scientific agreement on how many human races there are, on how many white races there are, on how you tell. So in the 20th century, and I used to have my students at Princeton do this, in the early 20th century, the way to tell various white races was to measure heads. So if you had a round head that was flat in the back, you were probably an alpine. <laughs> okay. If you had a long head and you were blonde and blue-eyed, then you were a Teutonic. And if you had a long head and you had dark hair and dark eyes, you were a Mediterranean. Any of you heard of those races? Yes, okay. But most of you, I suspect, have not. But those were important scientific terms in the early 20th century. So the means of differentiating and the names and all that Never has there been agreement. It is, race has always been a figment of the cultural imagination, not something in the body. And certainly, as the questioner pointed out, not permanent. So today we are faced with many children, in fact some grown-ups, with very complicated backgrounds. Now in the 20th century, if you were brown and you identified as, as black or African American or colored, uh, you could have all kinds of ancestors. So most of us who say we're black or African American have ancestors from three continents, from Africa, from America, and from Europe. And in fact, historians say that if you can trace your American ancestry back to the middle of the 19th century, you too, no matter how you identify, have ancestors from three continents, at least, at least. So we've always been mixed up. Human beings have been walking and moving since human beings became human beings. Human beings became human beings in Africa and started walking. And people have been walking and moving and migrating and I won't use the more graphic Anglo-Saxon term for it, but they've been having sex. <laughs> and they've been having sex with lots of different people. So everybody's mixed, and this is not a new thing. You asked the question about the word ethnicity. I hear this being substituted from time to time for race. It seems like a kinder, gentler word. And that's fine with me. Yes. Professor Painter, my name is Olivia McDavid Black Amore. So I'm a living, walking Black Amore. And that's what I've always called myself, yes. more so than African American. Fine. Now, we do know that the Africans went into Europe and other countries and intermingled and intermarried. Could you tell us a little more about that and how we're connected with the white race? Well, there's no such thing as a white race. Okay. There's no such thing as a black race. 
Races are things that people make up in order to differentiate you or me or somebody else from somebody else. It's a classification, a taxonomical issue. So um, as people moved, some settled. And when you settle, you start to change. Have you ever noticed how differently younger people sound from us when they talk? And that's just change is how people are. So it all happened one by one. You have sex, one, no. I was going to say you have sex one person at a time, but then I realized that you can have a lot of sex with a lot of people. Um, but generally you have sex with one person at a time. And what that produces or the situation under which it occurs, sex can be a loving, close, bond-making event, but it can also be um, a rape or something profoundly traumatic. So sex occurs in all kinds of situations among all kinds of people. Okay. Thank you. Yes. First of all, Professor, thank you for coming thank this you. morning. Thank um, you. This seems to be a common theme, but it, it, I come from this area like I think many of us come, and it's, it's a more multicultural area mm -hmm. now. Um, and so it seems to me that the battles of the 60s and the 70s and the 80s have started to be reflected in, in my children's, our children's generation. They seem to be much more comfortable crossing the lines with each other. So as a yes. historian, do you, are you hopeful for the future? Is, are we marching forward as a nation? Um, as a historian, I, no. As a human being, I am hopeful. I'm an optimist. If I weren't an optimist, I would have been long gone. Um, as a postmodern historian, I say that we don't always get better as time goes on. We don't, progress is not automatic, so I don't know what's going to happen in the future. However, I will say that the taxonomy of race is breaking down. The clearest way to see the breakdown is with the classification called Hispanic or Latino. So if you see Hispanic, Latino, there's an asterisk, and it says Hispanics, Latinos can be of any race. And something like uh, six to 10% of Latinos answering the 2000 census checked some other race. That's a lot of people. A lot of people are some other race. So, we are going to be seeing other ways. For myself, if I were designing it, I would ask, what about family wealth and what about income? Because I think that's where our policies need to go. But I don't design that. Thank you. Yeah. We have time for one more question. Ah, OK. Which of you wants it? Good morning. Uh, I live in D.C., predominantly black city, and I live in a predominantly black neighborhood and teach at a predominantly black college. And so the issue of race is one that I deal with regularly. And I just would be curious if you had any words of um, suggestion or advice for those of us who regularly, regularly interact with other races, specifically the black-white um, mm -hmm. dynamic, and what you would say to young people as well about about all of that? I would say to young people of any background, as I said to all of you, let us not emphasize difference and separation. Let us emphasize what we have in common and work together. That we don't just sit and say, I'm this and you're that. But let us figure out what it is we want to do and what we want to achieve and how we can do it together. Thank you very much. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.